Hello and welcome to another summary sermon, this time on the book of Daniel. Uh, Daniel the, was an incredible man. The key word for his book is dreams, because in almost every chapter there's a dream of some sort that he was interpreting. I don't want to focus too much today on those dreams. I rather want us to look at Daniel the man, uh, an incredible man, a man who found favor with three different kings. Uh, he found favor with Nebuchadnezzar, uh, who ruled for 43 years, and then also with Belshazzar, and finally with King Darius. Imagine finding favor with three different kings. That's incredible. Not only did he find favor with three kings, but there are three passages of Scripture. On three occasions, the archangel Gabriel appeared to Daniel and said, Daniel, you are greatly loved. Imagine if that happened to you. I, I, I'd be happy with just one. But three times, Gabriel came to Daniel and said, you are greatly loved by God. Now, I guess right here, you and I could sit back and say, you know what, this message is not going to be too relevant for me. Uh, it, Daniel's standards are just completely unattainable, and it's, I, I just don't fit in right here. This message is going to be discouraging for me. But I, I'm not so sure, because let's ask this question. What was it that made Daniel different? If we have a look in chapter 6, uh, I, I think in this passage, you and I can find the answer to what made Daniel different. Starts off telling the story of what happened during a time when King Darius was in charge. It says that he divided the kingdom into 120 provinces, and he appointed a high officer to rule over each province. The king also chose Daniel and two others as administrators to supervise the high officers and to protect the king's interests. Daniel soon proved himself more capable than all the other administrators and high officers. Because of Daniel's great ability, the king made plans to place him over the entire empire. Then the other administrators and high officers began searching for some fault in the way that Daniel was handling government affairs. But they couldn't find anything to criticize or condemn. He was faithful, always responsible, and completely trustworthy. So they concluded, our only chance of finding grounds for accusing Daniel will be in connection with the rules of his religion. So the administrators and the high officers went to the king and they said, long live King Darius. We are all in agreement. We administrators, officials, high officers, advisors, and governors, we're in agreement that the king should make a law, a law that will be strictly enforced, give orders that for the next 30 days, any person who prays to anyone, divine or human, except to you, your majesty, will be thrown into a den of lions. And now, your majesty, issue and sign this law so that it cannot be changed. An official law of the Medes and the Persians that cannot be revoked. So King Darius signed the law. But when Daniel learned that the law had been signed, he went home. And here's the key. He knelt down as usual in his upstairs room with its windows open toward Jerusalem. He prayed three times a day, just as he had always done, giving thanks to his God. You see, there, I think, is the secret. It's in Daniel's habits. What is a habit? Great question. A habit is a behavior that has been repeated so many times that by now it's become second nature. Just like driving a car. Have you ever been in the situation where you, know, you, you, you finish work at the office and it's been a, it's been a hectic day? Uh, everyone's argued with you, nothing's gone right, and you get in your car and it's serious traffic and in your mind you, you, you're just thinking about everything that went wrong and, and before you know it, you're at home. And you kind of question, how did I get here? Uh, you don't even remember driving home. 
because driving has just become completely second nature. Unlike when you first learned to drive and then you had to think of everything. It's like, which foot do I use to press the clutch? How do I press the brake? Is that the left foot? Is that the right foot? Uh, but after driving for so many years, it's become completely second nature. That's a habit. Now for Daniel, second nature for him was spending time with the God who he loved so much. You see, our, our first nature, the, those are the things that we do without thinking at all. And we do those from birth. Things like breathing, eating. That's our first nature. But when we do a particular behavior again and again and again, it becomes just like our first nature. It's our second nature. For Daniel, praying and spending time with God was just like that. Now, how do we form such a habit? Well, I guess if we look at some scripture verses like Romans chapter 12, it says, don't conform to the pattern of this world, but instead be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Now, now, if we just look at that verse, we could think that in order to form a habit, what we need to do is, is, is change our thinking. Renew your mind. And, and that is enforced by Proverbs 23. It says, for as a man thinks, so is he. Is that really the way to form a habit? You see, a more modern translation of that verse says this. For he is like one who is inwardly calculating. Eat and drink, he says to you, but his heart is not with you. In other words, there could be uh, the guy's thinking one thing, but then in his heart, he's going with something completely different. Maybe these verses aren't so much about changing our thinking. But yet, you and I have been pre-programmed to interpret these verses like this. Pre-programmed because of this guy. Descartes, René Descartes, who, a great philosopher uh, hundreds of years ago, but, but he came up with this thing. He said, the, we think, therefore we are. In other words, we are defined by our thinking. And, and we are only human because of the way we think. Mm, the Apostle Paul, he understood things a bit differently. He said this, this is my prayer. That your love may overflow more and more with knowledge and full insight to help you determine what is best, so that in the day of Christ you may be pure and blameless. You see, he, he was saying it's, it's our love that comes first and then our knowledge. Our, our thoughts don't flow from our love. I mean, our love doesn't flow from our thoughts. <laughs> it's the other way around. It's our thoughts that should be flowing out of our love. So here's the truth. We aren't what we think. We are what we love. And more importantly, we worship what we love. Do you know what you love? You might be saying, yeah, I, I, I think I know what I love. But do you really? Here's a test. If you're single, this might not make too much sense to you, but if, if you're married and you're watching this, um, you know, when you get married, you understand. I actually love myself a little bit more. <laughs> we, we, we get very, very selfish the minute the other person wants things done their way. And if, if you are married and maybe still in that kind of honeymoon phase and, and you think you know what you love, well, just have a child or two and you quickly understand how selfish you are here's the real question if what we love is is maybe not what we think we love let me ask you this question do we worship god or do we just think that we worship god or have we tried to program ourselves into thinking i love god i love god i love god but deep inside Maybe we're loving something else. To illustrate this, or, or to try and paint a picture for you, I, I want to take you on a, a very common worship experience. Um, this might sound as if you're walking into a church, but listen carefully to this. Actually, you're going to be walking into a shopping mall. The 
Upon approach, the architecture of the building has a recognizable code that makes us feel at home no matter what city we're in. The large glass atriums at the entrances are framed by banners and flags. Familiar texts and symbols on the exterior walls help the foreign faithful quickly and easily identify what's inside. For the seeker, there is a large map, a kind of worship aid, to help orient the novice to the location of various spiritual offerings and provide direction into the labyrinth that organizes and channels the ritual observance of the pilgrims. One can readily recognize the regulars, the faithful, who enter the space with a sense of achieved familiarity, who know the rhythms by heart because of habit-forming repetition. The design of the interior is inviting to an almost excessive degree, drawing both seekers and the faithful into the enclosed interior spaces, with windows on the ceiling open to the sky, but none on the walls open to the surrounding mode of automobiles. The sense conveyed is one of vertical or transcendent openness that at the same time shuts off the clamor and distractions of the horizontal, mundane world. This architectural mode of enclosure and enfolding suggests sanctuary, retreat, and escape. The layout of this temple has architectural echoes that harken back to medieval cathedrals, mammoth religious spaces designed to absorb all kinds of religious activities happening at one time. And so one might say that this religious building has a winding labyrinth for contemplation, alongside of which are innumerable chapels devoted to various saints. As we wander the labyrinth in contemplation, preparing to enter one of the chapels, we'll be struck by the rich iconography that lines the walls and interior spaces. Unlike the flattened depictions of saints one might find in stained glass windows, here one finds an array of three-dimensional icons adorned in garb that as with all iconography, inspires our desire to be imitators of these exemplars. These statues and icons, mannequins, embody for us concrete images of the good life. These are the ideals of perfection to which we will learn to aspire. This temple, like countless others now emerging around the world, offers a rich, embodied visual mode of evangelism that attracts us. This is a gospel whose power is beauty, which speaks to our deepest desires. It compels us to come, not through dire moralisms, but rather with a winsome invitation to share in this envisioned good life. As we pause to reflect on some of the icons on the outside of one of the chapels, we are thereby invited to consider what's happening within, invited to enter into the act of worship more properly, invited to taste and see. We are greeted by a welcoming acolyte who offers to shepherd us through the experience, but also has the wisdom to allow us to explore on our own terms if we so choose. Sometimes we will enter cautiously, curiously, tentatively making our way through this labyrinth within the labyrinth, having a vague sense of need but unsure of how it will be fulfilled, and so open to surprise to that moment where the spirit leads us to an experience we couldn't have anticipated. Having a sense of our need, we come looking, not sure what for, but expectant, knowing that what we need must be here. And then we hit upon it. Combing through the racks, we find the experience and offering that will provide fulfillment. At other times, our worship is intentional, directed, and resolute. We have come prepared for just this moment, knowing exactly why we're here, in search of exactly what we need. In either case, after time spent focusing on and searching in what the faithful call the racks, with our newfound holy object in hand, we proceed to the altar that is the consummation of worship. Behind the altar is the priest who presides over the consummating transaction. And this is a religion of transaction, of exchange and communion. When invited to worship here, we are not only invited to give, we are invited to take. We don't leave this transformative experience with just good feeling or pious generalities, but rather with something concrete and tangible, with newly minted relics, as it were, which are themselves the means to the good life embodied in the icons who invited us into this participatory moment in the first place. And so we make our sacrifice, leave our donation, 
but get in return something with solidity that is wrapped in the colors and symbols of the saints and the season. Released by the priest with a benediction, we make our way out of the chapel, not necessarily with the intention of leaving, but rather to continue contemplation and be invited into another chapel. Where are the other temples at which we worship? Do we worship at the temple of www.socialnetworks? Um, hashtag I spend far too much time here. Or perhaps we worship at some of the sporting temples. Perhaps you've even built your own shrine at home, a place where you worship series and movies. Do we really love God first and foremost? Or do we just think we love Him? Are there perhaps other things that are crowding our love for God out because our love for them appears to be greater? To end off with um, some, some even great quotes, um, just in case you might be thinking, that we are more devout than, than even Daniel because we spend more time praying uh, than Daniel did except the God that we're praying to is, is not the same God as the God that Daniel prayed to. Um, here's some quotes. That great philosopher Winnie the Pooh. Winnie the Pooh said, sometimes it's the smallest things that take up the most room in your heart. That wise man Solomon, he said, guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. And so to close this message, here's a benediction for you. May your worship of Jesus become second nature. Amen.